Hi everybody, welcome. My name is Caroline. Um, I am the social lead over here at Indigo and today I'm going to be talking with Michael Finkel. Um, he is the author of The Art Thief, which is our nonfiction staff pick of the month this, uh, this month. Um, he'll be joining in um, in a little bit. Um, this book is one that I was completely obsessed with when I started reading it. Um, I have not been able to stop talking about it. I have spoken to basically everyone who will listen about this book because it is such an enamoring story. It reads like fiction, but it is non-fiction. Um, if you like narrative non-fiction, this one's for you. It is an outrageous story and I can't Cannot wait to speak to um, Michael about it, who I have been told by his publisher um, likes to go by Mike, so I will be calling him Mike Finkel. And as soon as he jumps on, I'm going to turn off the uh, the comments. Uh, he's going to be joining us from the Penguin Random House uh, Instagram. Um, and so I'm going to just have a look and see if he's on yet. I'm excited for this. I have a lot of questions. Some I won't be able to ask because it'll ruin the book for you guys and I don't want you to, to do that because I loved it so much and I know you will too. Um, bear with me as I see. He might be here. Um, I sent an invite to Penguin Random House, just waiting for him to jump on. Hello. Hey, how are you? I'm Hi. good, very nice to meet you. My name is Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Mike Finkel here. So nice to meet you, Mike. I'm really excited to talk about The Art Thief. Um, bear with me. I'm just going to turn off our comments. It's been a little while since I've done this. So um, hang with me. No questions. Okay. Turn off comments. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them in the question box. Um, but I'm going to get started with this one. So I think your publisher may have told you, I haven't been able to stop talking about The Art Thief since I read it. Go ahead. That's uh, extraordinarily kind of you. Thank and you. congratulations on being our nonfiction staff pick of the month and one of our best books of the year so far. Thank you, that is amazing honor. Um, so before we dive very deeply into The Art Thief, well, we're not gonna dive as deep as I would like to go because I have so many questions I wanna ask you but I can't because I want everybody to have the experience I have. But I would love to chat with you about your books and what interests you because after I read this one, I read all your others. So you seem to be attracted to a very certain type of person. Um, there are these men that are outliers of society. I, I, I'm not sure, have you done much, uh, have you read much Anne Rand? I've read a little bit of Ayn Rand, for sure. And they all seem to fit into objectivism. The philosophy of objectivism is what I notice. Oh, this is like, this is like a new theory to me. I'm, I'm curious. Hey, so from what I, I read with all of your books and from what I know of Ayn Rand and what I've read of her is objectivism is about almost selfishness, is personal happiness is the most important thing to the person who believes and objectivism and from your three books stranger in the woods totally like left society just wanted to do what he wanted to do live in the woods for 27 years and um with true story was completely all about what worked for him like stole from work so that he could afford his wife's engagement ring like just was able to justify every single thing and i'm so curious what interests you about these characters all right well i've not heard this objectivism theory so i'm sort of, sort of like digesting you know uh as a, one of the advantages of being a writer is that you can cogitate upon something forever i worked like 11 years on this book so you know coming up with a spontaneous answer about that might be well let's a large... let's put a pin in this and we'll come back to this at the end let's talk about the earth thief because okay. this book this character who is a real person is outrageous so why don't you, because I mean, I think I know this book backwards and forwards, but no one's here to listen to me. Let's hear you. What 
how did this story land on your desk and like what made you interested in it and give us a little synopsis of what it's about Okay, so The Art Thief is, first of all, let's just stress that it is nonfiction. This is not based on a true story, kind of a true story. It's 100% of a true story. It's about a, a man named Stefan Breitweiser, who is possibly the most prolific art thief of all time. And I would say that three things really, really got me by my journalistic, whatever, getting spot. And uh, first of all, is the just the sheer amount of art that this person stole. Uh, I spent the entire pandemic reading about art thieves, and I'll tell you that the second most prolific art thief of all time stole from 19 museums. But Stefan Breitweiser stole from 201 places, so. And for those who don't know, could you please tell us what the value of the artwork that he stole is? Okay, so it's been estimated to be as high as two billion dollars worth of art but it wasn't even the sheer numbers right, right that, that that for happened. our canadian audience this is two billion us which means 2.7 billion canadian friends i mean at this point at this point it's just a heck of a lot of money it's really insane value but it wasn't really the number of thefts it wasn't even the value of the thefts i liked the way that stefan breitweiser stole he was used his girlfriend as his accomplice. Mm -hmm. He stole during the day, sometimes with guards, sometimes with tourists in the room, no violence, no weapons, which makes him sort of a, you know, going back to your Ayn Rand theory, which sort of makes him a, an anti-hero that you can maybe root for. But it wasn't even his methodology or his number of thefts that really brought me into a, the level of obsession. It was why he stole. Yes. And even though, yeah. Why he stole, he stole for the love of art. Unlike almost any other art thief, he stole for aesthetic desire. He stole just to put them on the walls of his bedroom and admire them. It wasn't, I mean, $2 billion is very impressive, but it really wasn't for the money. It was for the sheer aesthetic pleasure of it. And that combination of three things was like journalistic catnip to me. And can you also tell us what his bedroom looked like, where this $2 billion plethora of beautiful artworks lived? Right, so where did he put his 200 thefts, more than 300 works, because sometimes he would steal more than one piece of art. He, Breitweiser, and his girlfriend, and Catherine Kleinklaus, lived in a, he lived, he lived with his mother in a really nondescript house in the suburbs of a French town called Malouze. And if you haven't heard of Malouze, that's because no tourists go there. It's the ugliest part of a beautiful country of France. It's where automobiles, manufacturing, and chemical plants are there. So he lives in this nondescript house in the suburbs. It's, if, if you ask like a two-year-old to draw a picture of a house, they would draw a square with a triangle on top. And that's pretty much what this house looked like. You walk in the very modest front door, his mother lived on the ground floor. You go up this narrow flight of stairs that leads to an attic chamber, low ceiling where the, uh, the beams are sort of low. And in, you open this door and I have seen home video of it. This is possibly, hey. I mean, I get chills thinking about this. You open this door and in these two tiny rooms, in the middle of, of everything is a beautiful four poster bed where Breitweiser and his girlfriend, Anne Catherine slept, but all over the walls on every flat spot, everywhere are amazing works of art, paintings, ivory, gold, silver, mother of pearl, weapons, mu musical instruments, goblets, chalices, you know, serving dishes, amazing. Like, it just glitters with brightness. It is like, it's basically that Breitweiser and his girlfriend lived inside of a treasure chest, and I would love to have spent just five oh. minutes in that room. I dream of it. And let's talk a little bit about what started him on this journey of art thievery. And also, yeah, let's start there. I mean, this is like we said before, this is nonfiction. So, I interviewed Breitweiser extensively, mm -hmm. and he said that for Bre Breitweiser grew up in a fairly well-to-do family. His father had a beautiful art collection, and his parents had a terrible divorce when he was a teenager, and his father basically took, or his father did, take all of the collectibles uh, with him when he left the family, and, his, and Breitweiser moved in with his mother. And he said that at first, 
his idea was to replace the things that his father had taken during the divorce. And the first thing he ever stole was a beautiful flintlock pistol from the early 1700s that he said was just like something his father owned, but a heck of a lot more valuable. But after four or five thefts, really, his collection had already surpassed anything his father owned. And so that excuse may be, you know, you can tell by the look on my face. Yeah. I give it full credence. You know, the guy loved artwork. He loved to steal, and he found this girlfriend whom he, who he was in love with, and together they made this ridiculously unstoppable team. It was such an interesting, like, the correlation between the way that he loved his girlfriend and the way that he loved art in your book was really interesting. It was like he was obsessed with her, like, due to her beauty to him, and and then he became like it was the same relation that he had with his art and i recall like i mean after i read your book i i of course went down that google spiral and read <laughs> everything that i could and and you know and and friends when you read this book trust me you're gonna you're gonna be diving deep into the the google rabbit hole of this man <laughs> um he didn't like calling himself an art thief. He didn't like putting himself in that same category. Can you tell us a little bit about why and, and what that meant to him? Well, I thought it was really funny when Brightweiser said to me during one of our interviews, I really don't like being called an art thief. And I asked him why, you know, when you think about an art thief, you might either be thinking of one of two things, you might be thinking of like Ocean's Eleven and Thomas Crown Affair mm -hmm. coming through like, uh, 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 skylights and you know throwing smoke bombs that that's the movies this is a real art thief so what if i said think about a real art theft you might be thinking of the isabella stewart gardner museum in boston in 1990 when two guys broke in at night attacked the night guards bound their faces with duct tape handcuffed them to pipes in the basement but the brightweiser never wanted to be violent but then what those gardeners did is they went to the most beautiful work in the museum in Boston and stuck a knife into a Rembrandt canvas and sliced it out of its frame. They basically destroyed a painting. Breitweiser believed that paint, that works that he stole had to be handled as if they were newborn babies. And he was obsessive about maintaining the humidity and the light and the dust in his attic. He told me mm. that the tour, not that he took better care of, muse of, of his work than they did in museums and he loved them more. Uh, so what did, you know, so I said to him, so if you don't want to be called an art thief, what would you like to be called? And he told me, I, I <laughs> without, know exactly with, where you're going. without any sarcasm, I just, I have to laugh and I'm doing the translation from the French. He said, he, he wants to be called a collector with an unorthodox mm -hmm. acquisition mm -hmm. style. So uh, he really wanted to be thought of as a collector. And you mentioned the girlfriend. And one of the things that I do love about this story is, you know, theft after theft can be a little bit cold, but I think there's a love affair running through the heart of this book that gives the book like its heart and its warmth and it's like its passion besides just for objects. And, you know, everyone who I met that knew Breitweiser and Anne Catherine described their relationship as uh, maybe toxic, unhealthy, uh, a bad idea, but they also said, and this is, this is the most dangerous thing in the world, that they were truly in love with each other. And I did like the comparison uh, Carolyn, that you made between Brightweiser's feeling for his girlfriend and his feeling for his art. And I, I think that's a great point. I think there was similar obsession, passion, um, ridiculous outlier behavior on both accounts. And it's, it's, it's so interesting, like his desire to replace what his father had, what he thought taken away from him. And then this this isn't ruining anything, I promise you, friends, in the book. But eventually him and, and, and Katrina are not together, but he gets another girlfriend who is basically a replacement for her, like looks identical to her. So it it's it's just such an interesting dichotomy there of his his like he needs to replace what he feels like he's owed. And what I found really interesting in the book was he said to you he wanted to be called an art liberator. <laughs> I mean, I loved the heroes of the world, you know, like all the, the freedom fighters and the nurses and the frontline mm -hmm. doctors. Those, uh, those people are amazing to me, but I think it's just the scofflaws and the scallywags and the criminals that really just get my interest. Um, you know, those, those are the people that are, I don't know that I feel the 
I feel I feel the ones that those are the ones I want to talk to. And weirdly, those are the people that want to talk to me. And so, you know, I love listening to I'm just going to say this. I, there's no editing here. I love listening to criminals theories of the world. And one thing that Breitweiser told me, again, straight face, like he was a collector with an unorthodox acquisition style. He told me that really, when you think about it, museums are just prisons for art. I and, really have that in my notes to bring up. Right, right. Like, he's not wrong. I, I but everybody isn't he, listening. Isn't I mean, he wrong? Like, I love going to museums. Museums are one of the most amazing social goods that we have. I think you and I can talk about the problems of modern society from now till next year, but museums are not one of the problems. They're one of the great benefits and joys of modern society. I'm not a billionaire. You're probably not a billionaire, um, but yet we can see the Mona Lisa and see the greatest works of art that humans have ever made by going to a museum. Now, Breitweiser abused that trust, was a cancer on the public trust, but Let's just think about this. Do you think that Leonardo da Vinci, when he was making the Mona Lisa, do you think he thought to himself, you know how I picture people seeing this thing? I picture 500 people jammed to a, into a room, everybody elbowing for a little bit of space, and you could just see it for a minute before someone's head is in front of you. And that's the way you do see the Mona Lisa now. Now, I think it'd be better to lay in a couch with your loved one and drink a glass of wine, maybe as the sun is setting. Oh, I so mean, a thousand place, right? percent. But do we also think... Leonardo da Vinci would want the Mona Lisa in a grubby attic where only like few people could see it and his mother wasn't even allowed in. Like, you know, <laughs> Carolyn, I agree. I mean, I'm not endorsing by what you it's, say, it's, I'm just saying. It's, it was just, I, let's go back a little bit to the way that this book was written and how. So what you can't really tell, and like, it's really fun for me to have the hard copy because I had the uh, advanced readers copy. And so I didn't have the pictures in it. And friends, what you will see is once you get this book, there are pictures of some of the stolen artwork in it, um, which is really awesome to, to see because you want those references. One in particular um, that's mentioned in the very, very beginning of the book is the marble Adam and Eve here. And you're, you're definitely gonna wanna see that when, when it's being spoken about because it's really interesting. But the pacing of this book, I wanna talk about a bit because this is a huge story. This is a story that reads like fiction and reads like a movie. Like it is stranger than fiction because I don't think you could write a movie from fiction that is this story without, without it being true. Like it is so unbelievable and bonkers. I don't know another <laughs> one. But, but the, the book is only 209 pages and like it really could have been 500 pages. The pacing is so, I read this in a day and then I read it again. Well, I mean, I'm so honored that you'd say that. I have three young children. In fact, it's my son's 16th birthday today. After we do this, I'm going to go to my Every All the drivers that are listening, watch out. There's going to be another driver on the road. I'm trying <laughs> my hardest to teach them how to drive. Well, anyway, I have a busy life and I could have written, a, in fact, my first draft, uh, I don't think I've ever mentioned this, was 1,200 single spaced pages. I called it my block of granite. There's, so, there's 201 thefts, there's a love affair, there's a relationship with his mother, there's a police chase, you know, but I really, I respect readers' times, time, I respect people's busyness, and I really like a fast paced, uh, that's what I like to read. And so, uh, you know, I wanna write what I like to read. And if you can't finish the book on one international plane flight, and for some reason, I live near Salt Lake City, I love, I love France. So one Salt Lake City to Charles de Gaulle flight, you should be able to finish it on. And if, you know, and even stick it in the pocket right in front and leave it for the next person if you want. I, I feel like that's like, that's the kind of book that I like. Uh, I admire and sometimes read big door stoppers, but more often than not, I'm like, I got too many children. I got too much in my life. And let's, you know, I need to get to the point. And I, I, I don't mean to make everything so rushy and fast, but that's- It didn't that's, feel rushy and fast. Good. It was just, unput downable. I was like, I can't believe this. And I will tell you this, friends listening in, to me, there's two endings in the book. When you get to one particular point, I can't tell you what it is because my mind was blown. I was like, my jaw was open the whole time. I was like, what are you talking about? And then what happens next with, with, Brett Weiser's actions. I, I, I was like, 
I like almost slammed the book. I was like, are you kidding me? You gotta be kidding me. I so want to talk about this so badly, but we can't because it, it, everybody needs that moment when they read this book of, of what happens with him. And I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about how this story came to you and, and how you got access to him because not many people do. I mean, if you were to describe my working methods in one word or less, I would say it would be inefficient. Uh, I, oh my goodness, I guess, I guess really nobody's in this writing business to be efficient or that just doesn't work for me. I spent 11 years on this project. So let's do the math there. That's like 11 years. years. That's like, that's like 20 pages a year. That's like a page and a half a month on average. Well, I mean, that's we just read 1200. <laughs> I, that's a good point. I mean, uh, so Brightweiser had never spoken to an American journalist before. He had rarely spoken to anyone. Um, I had read a little piece about him in the French media. And again, those three things, the amount of crimes, the, the, the way that he did it without violence, and the fact that he did it for love was like, <laughs> my head exploded. And I wrote him a letter, handwritten. I speak French. Uh, my accent is about is the worst, but, uh, uh, you know, it, I wrote him a letter in my bad French. And... Uh, it took him eight months to respond. And by the time he responded, my wife and my family and I had moved to France, had nothing to do with Stefan Breitweiser and everything to do with wanting to learn another language and culture. And uh, we sent letters back and forth to each other for four years before Breitweiser finally agreed to meet me for lunch. And even then he said, you cannot bring a pen, notebook or, or recorder. It was oh. just to meet. And we met and of course I wanted to ask him about all his stuff, but I could just read him that he was just sort of feeling me out to see if I was trustworthy or something. And maybe it was my, uh, my shit, my bad French or my, sorry. Or okay. My, we're, we're, or, we're, we're okay with that word. <laughs> or my, I didn't go all the way on that one. You know what, the story's so good, we don't mind a little cursing. <laughs> <laughs> or, or it was something, but he finally, after our lunch and four years of letter writing, agreed to meet with me and we built up, we, we spent more than 40 hours together. We did tons of interviews and we even, this was possibly the, one of the most uh, morally bizarre moments of my entire 30 year reporting career, which, career, which was going into museums with the world's oh, wow. greatest art thief. You know, he's banned from most museums in Europe, so he just put on a light disguise, a baseball hat, he doesn't wear glasses, he put fake glasses on, and we're walking through museums. There's nothing in the world like walking through a museum with, a great, with the world's greatest Imagine, art thief. I can't believe he's allowed in any museum. I, I, wouldn't even let him, I wouldn't let him into like a child's museum. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself the whole time, like, so what am I going to do if he steals something? Am I going to turn in my own subject? And I'm happy to report that I did not have to face that moral dilemma, but it was crazy. And, you know, I, th I think there's another thing that comes out in this book that at least I loved the reporting part. There's the crimes, which are fun to read about. There's the love affair with his girlfriend, which is all over the map and bizarre. But I really liked, and you mentioned that with the Adam and Eve showing that before, I really liked all things, all stealing aside. I really liked the way Brightweiser, the art thief, encountered a work of art you know i think that most of us have this tendency to intellectualize in museums which is kind of odd like oh look at that form look at that brush stroke look at that color and brightweiser approached everything i would say heart first with like emotion first like he would weep in front of sad photos he would be mortified in front of, of photos uh, i mean in front of uh, pic images of war he'd be rapturous in front of religious uh, works of art, and he would be turned on in front of sexy works. And I, I love the way he sort of import, imparted that feeling to me. And I'm hoping that people who read the book the next time they go to a museum that changes the way they look at it. I don't know if that happened with you. The, well, I mean, it's, I, 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 I kept picturing everything and just like wanting to look at it all. And that's actually something I'm really glad you brought that up because that's something I wanted to, to talk about was what he stole and why and what you noted and what he's noted is he never stole the most expensive piece. He only stole the particular pieces that moved him on site. And like, that was really interesting to me. And, and they were small pieces most of the time. And because that's what he could carry, but like the way that he spoke about the love and the passion for it was really interesting.
Yeah, I mean, Breitweiser told me again, he's, you know, he has some bizarre theories about you know, being an art liberator, museums are prisons for art. He also said that it would be stupid to steal art for money, which is mm -hmm. what most art thieves says. Uh, money can be made with much less risk. That he felt that the pieces that he stole were only ones that he had fallen in love with. Now, you know, the big one, the huge pieces he couldn't steal, pieces that were too well guarded, he couldn't steal. But he would only take something that he truly loved. Now, I think everybody listening to this, if I said, imagine something beautiful, I think we would all think of something different. It could be a sunset over the Rocky Mountains. It could be a work of art. It could be a lover. We all love different things. And I, I mean, thank goodness. What if we, we all love the same thing? There would be just one book and one, one type of food to eat and one uh, work of art. And Breitweiser had a specific just, I mean, attraction is really an understatement. He was obsessed with the late Renaissance and early Baroque period, which is the 16th and 17th century when oil colors, which just are so richly vibrant and uh, uh, oil colors were introduced and painters no longer were beholden to the church. So the subject matter really increased. Now these are not the, the works that I traditionally love, but I don't <laughs> think that mattered because, you know, I like much more modern art, Picasso and later perhaps, but that doesn't matter. It was sort of the way that Breitweiser encountered works, this sort of o bubbling over of uh, enthusiasm, emotion, desire, uh, really affected me. And even, even though I'm not a big Renaissance art fan, it's certainly, like I said, the next time I went to a museum and saw like a Van Gogh, I sat in front of it and rather than intellectualizing and noting balance of form, I just went with pure emotions. And I'm telling you, I please, everybody who's listening, next time you're in a museum, turn off the art professor in your head and just look at it, like Breitweiser told me, like you're 10 years old, like you're just seeing something purely with um, non, let's say non-critical eyes. I mean, obviously whether you're attracted to it or not is going to be just something innate, but like just absorb it with your emotions before you start intellectualizing. That's what Breitweiser taught me. And I hope that everyone takes that home with them. It's, it's interesting because like he did develop such a knowledge. And I remember at one point in, in your book, and this is something I, I, I wanna jump back to a little bit, is um, at the trial, he's explained like there's a piece of art that there's an art expert um explaining and saying it was from one period and he was like oh no excuse me only this part of it was from this period if you look at this this is not and like the expert was was blown away by his knowledge and that was really interesting to see like although like this man is a criminal through and through like he felt no remorse and like Correct me if I'm wrong, but still does not. I mean, I love everything that you're saying. So basically, in a nutshell, the Stefan Breitweiser, the art thief, is all shades of gray. It's like easy to be disgusted with him. And then at the, like the next moment, like I'm kind of admiring him. Uh, at, you know, after 11 years, this is why I like this project, uh, Carolyn, because after 11 years, like I'm still not sure how I feel about him. Uh, you know, it's like I, I sort of move around and I, I don't know, I love reading books. I'm a reader more than I am a writer and I don't like an author telling me how to feel. And so I just try and lay everything down and I'm like really interested for anybody out there. Just wonder who likes Frightweiser, who doesn't like him and how everyone feels about him. I think the readers are sort of like the jury to me. Like you can read his life story and then you decide where he falls on the spectrum between like, ah, is he trying to do something? Is he like a great artist himself or is he just a uh, just a cancer on, on yeah. society and none of those things are wrong he's you know he's, he's like charming in one way and then so selfish in another like there were times yeah. where oh i hate you and like oh i'm so interested <laughs> in you I, i'd love to touch a little bit because we haven't touched this um yet on how he stole the art because that to me was such an interesting part because as we said he didn't go in like you know, from the rooftops. He wasn't like all dressed in black, like scurrying around with laser beams at night. It was, <laughs> it was so nuanced and so interesting. Yeah, Breitbart was, was sort of a master of uh, psychological uh, manipulation and subterfuge. For example, how did, how did he enter oh, the museum? Oh, I'm gonna interrupt for one second. Please? Um, we have people, the name of the book is The Art Thief and it's by Mike, Michael Finkel, who likes to go by Mike, who is with me right here. It is excellent. It is our 
stuff pick of the month nonfiction. So it's also on sale this month and it is one of Indigo's best books of the year so far. And it's, it is excellent. Okay. Jump back. Thank you. Thank you, Indigo. I mean, just briefly, I mean, there's so many little, there's so many threads we can pull out in, in, in this Oh my book. God. My head is like, oh my, can I, can we discuss all these other things without feel, making, you know, feeling like we're just touching on everything, but briefly, like, so how did Breitweiser get into museums? Well, he just went to the front desk and bought a ticket, uh, paid in cash. He had this theory. Now I mentioned the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum guys that ripped paintings off, uh, you know, out of their frames with a knife. He would, he worked, by the way, Stefan Breitweiser worked in a frame shop for a while, so he learned how to detach and attach frames. So if he saw a, a painting, he would carefully detach the frame, and then he would always hide the painting at the small of his back and know that a painting without a frame is as delicate as a newborn. He would cover it with his jacket and walk carefully out of the museum, and he would do this like a street musician, sometimes with people in the room, as I mentioned. Now, to get into a display case to steal that beautiful ivory object that you showed everyone, how do you get into a display? display case. They're locked with solid locks. Those things cannot be picked. Well, all Bright Breitweiser's only tool that he used, no, no skylight entries, no smoke bombs. He had a tiny Swiss Army knife. And to get into display cases, he merely, like a surgeon, cut along the seams of where the, where the panels meet. They're sealed with silicon glue. And just like a surgeon would cut vertically and horizontally and be able to just pry the panels uh, far enough apart that he could snake his hand through, grab something like that beautiful ivory, pull it out the opening, push the panels back together. Just by tension, they would maintain their original shape, and it would look, the lock would be locked the entire time. It would look as if nothing had been stolen. Now, he would never run out of a museum. In fact, Breitweiser once told yeah. me another confounding Breitweiserism, which is that something that an art thief would never do is precisely what an art thief should consider doing. For example, after stealing a work more than once, he and his girlfriend, who served as his lookout, went to the museum cafe and ate. They have like a multi-million dollar, you know, piece of silver or work with them, but they're eating casually in the cafe and it's on them. Now, if the police are running into a museum looking for a thief, what they're not going to, the last place they're going to think of to go is the people casually eating lunch. And so it was this, crazy but yet sort of evil genius way of subverting all of our expectations buying a ticket sometimes he would say goodbye at the at you know as he was walking out goodbye thank you to the front desk as he's it's walking out the door mesmerizing like I, this, I can't get over it i like i want to see this made into a movie i i need to see it made into it. And <laughs> i was googling and i saw there was one with like michael pitt being made and i kept looking to see when and where like <laughs> My friends, you need to read this book. Everybody at who I work with at Indigo, who has had the chance to speak with me over the last few months, I have told them about this book. I have told other journalists. I have not been able to stop. You, like We've talked a lot about what's inside it, but there is so much more. And we didn't talk about the two endings, which we won't talk about, um, what I call the two endings, because they're so jaw-dropping. I cannot stress enough how much you need to read this book. And what would be super fun is go to a museum or an art gallery and read it in there. I love that idea. Now, please, everybody, leave the works on the wall. Exactly. You, you can't admire. Yeah, I mean, I love what you said. First of all, thank you very much. And thanks oh, to Indigo pleasure. and to you personally. I, I mean, there's so many books out there to hear your enthusiasm is. I don't think I'll be able to get my ego out the door behind me at this rate. Um, it's been, you've been so flattering. Uh, I mean, I love that. And, you know, I, I agree with you. There's not just the, I mean, like any good Icarus story, there's nobody I don't think flew higher, or took more risks than Stefan Breitweiser. But the second part of the book is the crash. And I kind of think Gosh. it's extraordinary and bizarre as the, insane, you know, thieving, you know, for between the late 1990s and the middle, you know, the middle of the, of the 2000s, Breitweiser averaged, it's, it's incredible, one art theft every 12 days for nearly a decade. That is incredible. But then his crash is even more mind blowing. And I, you know, whether or not you like the story, that is up to the readers, but the facts of the case are just astonishing i've never really come up, come upon a story so rich in my life and like i said i'm blessed that i 
learn to speak French and that Breitweiser granted me these interviews and uh, I'm so happy to bring his story. I'm so happy, uh, to, happy to speak with you too because it was it was it was a very fascinating read and friends even if you are not a nonfiction reader I'm telling you this book reads like fiction it's not fiction a hundred percent true but it it reads like a fiction book where you are and just stuck you can't get out of the thoughts of it and I'm, I'm still blown away by it. And I still think about, oh, there are parts that I so want to talk about and <laughs> that made me so angry and just, oh, but I can't do it to you all. I would love to have a conversation with you again offline about this. And I'd love to hear what you think about my um, objectivism theory as well. Um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, it's like, I'm cogitating about that mm -hmm. on the back of my head. And I was also thinking if anybody really wants to let me know how they felt about either the book or Brightwiser, please go to my website, Mike Finkel, michaelfinkel.com. They all go to the same spot. Feel free to send me a, a note. I really love interacting uh, with readers. So any of these things that we're specifically not talking about, if anybody feels the need to continue the conversation, send me a note, let's continue it. I love that. I can't thank you enough for this conversation. I could talk to you for another hour. But it is your son's birthday. We are six minutes over and I have just enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been an honor and what a pleasure. And I just, your enthusiasm is infectious. Thank you so What's much. What's next? Oh, stay tuned for another crazy true crime drama. This one about a, a high, a airplane hijacker that's been in hiding for 40 years. Let's oh, just... oh, and this is curious. Where is Brightweiser now? I have been trying to find out where he is and I cannot figure it out. That's fair. I, I'm glad that you asked me that. Without giving anything away at the end, he is, you know, he is being controlled by the French penal system. He's 53, born in 71, so he's 52 years old right now. And he is in a heap of hot water for, you know, he does get caught in the end, but we'll leave mm -hmm. exactly how and what happens to his amazing collection for later. But he is, he is a, uh, He's under house arrest now, um, but uh, is facing more criminal charges and he's gonna be an old man before he's uh, completely free. What an interesting story. And then when can we expect your hijacker book? <laughs> I, I, did I say that I was inefficient? I can't. <laughs> okay, well, you gotta let us know because I'm gonna read that one too. I would be honored. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, uh, your enthusiasm is so wonderful. It's just spilling out of my phone and filling up my little office here in Park well, City, Utah. I'm glad. I won't keep you longer because I know you do have to celebrate with a soon-to-be driver. <laughs> I hope you have the most enjoyable evening. And thank you again. And friends, it's The Art Thief. It's on sale at Indigo right now. We're with Michael Finkel. It is our staff pick of the month for August which means you get a discount for the month of August. And it is one of our best books of the year so far. Thank you, Indigo. I really appreciate the support. I would, be, I would not be able to be a writer without you, so thank you. Thank you. We look forward to the next one. Thank you, everybody, for joining us as well. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Are we done?